How are you doing? I'm good. How are you? Yeah, I can't remember when the last time I saw you, actually. I know, it's been forever. Yeah, I've been uh, keeping up on Instagram. What, what are you doing? You're smashing it at the minute, right? I, I, I never post on Instagram, so I, I post like maybe when something good happens. That's, yeah, what, yeah, that's, yeah, what, you, yeah. that's what you do, right? Um, yeah, 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 yeah. I don't mean, I work, I work in film now. I do sound, like sound mixing, you know. Most yeah. production stuff, so nice. it's fun. It's not as glamorous, but it's fun. Well, not as glamorous as uh, eating crisp sandwiches in the back of a two hundred capacity yeah. van yeah. in, in the yeah. back of the Adelphi. <laughs> yeah, right. right. <laughs> yeah, or, yeah, riding on the on the back of an amp. In the, yeah, exactly. The it's what we love. I miss it. To be fair. Yeah, if I could do it for an hour, and then come back, I would do it. But yeah yeah exactly yeah <laughs> maybe maybe one day one day off one day on two weeks off where's that dude uh, all right that's it all right am i on my own oh here he is sick fuck me <laughs> you still think you still think you're a fucking rock star don't you telling up this look let me tell you oh, something man. my kids think they're the fucking rock stars now they're like just wait just do it now i'm a fucking mess <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> <fucking> mess. <laughs> it's all a fucking mess this is like a five o'clock heroes gig this is like you know, <laughs> everything goes wrong <laughs> that is true everything, everything goes wrong everything goes wrong i mean look look elliot looks like he's the same age as the last time i saw him it's amazing it's, so it's the lighting it's the lighting how you boys doing i'm in the hall now actually i just got to the hall is it that's nice. Yeah. Good old Hall. Yeah. Good old Hall, Elliot. Elliot left a few. Uh, are we still? Are we recording yet? <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. Come on, tell us. Elliot left a few. This is what we want. Yeah. I didn't leave a few anything in Hall. I left a few. Uh, I remember my beautiful chef shirt. Someone nicked it. I reckon Elliot just took it because he thought it was a shit shirt that I wore for every show, and just. To, I remember that it. shirt. Yeah. No, the prop. The problem was, it was such a weird shirt. I was like, that's weird. Wear that. And then you're like, okay, for the next three years. Like, <laughs> like I, I met one day, but all right. Yeah, I I didn't um I didn't plan on wearing it, but I didn't really know what know what else to what else to wear. How, how did you wash it ever? Of course not. Never wore, I never wore it. I never was it, wore it. was it maroon or something? No, am I getting that wrong? It was like it a was black. black. I had a red flap. Red. You know, have like red. anyone <laughs> oh, just Google, Google Google chef shirt, and then imagine it. Imagine it black with the, the inner oh, flap yeah. red. Like Wait a second. Out. I I was coming. What I would do is I would work. A, I do it. I do a chef's, you know, shift in the local restaurant. They come straight for straight for straight to the stage. I mean, I did. Yeah, hard, hard yeah. Time, he, he worked. He worked at Little Chef. So we, there's like one in every city. <laughs> Yeah, little Chef was about as far as I got there. Yeah. What was on the menu for Little Chef? I can't remember. Right. <laughs> Good. This Lord. is what this, this is what why people are listening to podcasts. Like, <laughs> yeah. Reminisce well, about the Little Chef menu. Yeah. My goodness. So how how's everything else going? I, I see you you've done a lot of these these interviews. I was listening to the Guy Apple one. <laughs> and they don't. I, I was basically lived with Guy, and when we were in London, I mean, I was oh, there right. with him with him for months at a time. Did you go to school with Guy? <laughs> I went to school with a guy for a year or so. I was at school with his brother. And yeah, well, um, yeah. his brother was uh, uh, the same age as me. Guy was a couple of years younger than me. But his brother was the same age as me, the same, same age group as me. And Abby Rotter as well. <laughs> Abby, yeah, Abby was in, it was in, she was in the year below me. And then she was such, so, so she was, I remember, yeah, we would hang out all the time. And um, every time we came to London for shows, we'd always, Happy was always around. It was great. It was great to see. It was a good, it was a nice crew. It was always sort of coming to see family, really. Where do we start with this? Where do we start? Where do we, where's, where's the beginning yeah. of all of this? Should we do that first question and like, just give I, an I, idea? I haven't even looked at these questions. What was the first question? No, we, so yeah, some of these the first... questions, uh, I was like, are these questions... I bet a lot of bands have some interesting answers to some of these questions. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I feel, like, feel like we're going to let everyone down. 
but yeah, hopefully knows. hopefully we'll you know we'll give a different perspective yeah just for like a bit of context like can you tell us how you formed the band and then went I'm, from that point to releasing that first album well i, I can tell you my 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 remember my memory of it i i met elliot on bedford avenue if I, that was the first meeting I, I met Elliot, and we went to the local bar there. And it wasn't, it didn't look like it does now. I'll tell you that now. Um, and I don't know what it looks like actually, and I haven't seen it in the last five years, but five years ago it looked pretty, pretty nice. But I guess uh, it wasn't that nice then. And uh, yeah. we met and we got together. I guess we just started playing, just me and Elliot initially. Was that in London um, or New York then? No, it was in New York. York. Sorry, right. Bedford yeah. Avenue was in New York. Right. Yeah, Bedford Avenue, Wexford. I mean, you know what? Like, I think it's been a while. I think I think we can just we can just Skip tell everyone. Bit. No, no, we can tell everyone that uh, it was you. Fuck, you put a fucking ad on Craigslist. I know we didn't want to like. I feel like it wasn't cool to say that for a while. But you put an ad on Craigslist, being like, I, I want to, you know, play music with someone, and then I remember you listed like. The Clash and the Kinks. Um, there might have been some more other questionable uh, influences <laughs> that I that I ignored, but I was like, I like Catch the Clash. Google. Um, and uh, yeah, and then so you're like, all right, fine, let's meet up. And then we met up, and you're like, let's do it. <laughs> that was that was basically it. And then I think we like you had a handful of songs, and then I I learned them, and then we had a we we kept revolving drummers forever, um, and we Mikey. That was Mikey Williams. Yeah, we played a show like six days later or something to no one. <laughs> At a place, a place called the, Con the Continental in the, oh in the East Village. Oh my god! Holy Anyone shit! That, I don't know if that I place is still around. That show. We played that show, and the singer from the Twenty Twos was bartending. I remember that was a good band, a girl band, Twenty Twos, and sh and I remember that. We had a bass player then called Greg Richardson, who who was like basically asleep on the bass. I remember Mikey played drums. Yeah, and then yeah, and he he after the show, he was a nice guy. After the show, he was like, "Hey, Elliot, it was nice to meet you. Uh, I'm leaving the band." And then he got in the cab and left. <laughs> <laughs> and then and then we got then we got Nate, then we got Nader like a, a couple weeks later, I think. <laughs> and he came in in uh, yeah, he's gonna love me saying this, but. He came in in his little uh, sort of three, you know, half, what, what were the little shorts he had? He just come from his with a little pouch on the back as his, he was a bike messenger then. And he was uh, delivering uh, God knows what. And he came in and was like, hi, what's up? And um, I think Mikey was still playing drums just, just with us, just trying to, I mean, you know, we didn't have Mikey. He was the, he was the oldest person musician i knew at the time probably and you know he, he was kind of very mature to kind of keep things together and uh, nader came in and it sort of just worked between between the four of us right am i am i, am I sort of getting it right there yeah i mean how much backstory do i, I feel like no one knows how much backstory we are. i don't want to bullshit we, well no but i'm saying like we're, we're like a, this this new york based band that was half british half american um and we did a ton of touring in the UK and not much. We did one US tour. We played a lot in New York. So we were kind of like, I don't like, I couldn't decide. It was like, were we part of the New York scene or were we part of like the UK scene? I don't know. We were like, both. Yeah, so like, just take time. me back a little bit. Like, Anthony, what were you doing in New York to start with? Anything. I was working <laughs> at a place called. No, but I, I mean. Working. We just uh, work. I mean, work, I was, work, I was so working. Why, as why a, did you end up there? Like, well, I had a brother who who went to college in in in, uh, in America, and he he sort of I went up. I lived upstate New York with him for a while, and he played music, and he sort of got me into it. And then I came down to New York at the exact right moment. You know, it was sort of that perfect time. Um. It's just, it, I should have met Elliot then. I met him like sort of three years late, two years later maybe. But it was like this exact moment where there was a lot of open mics going on. Everybody was playing, at, uh, you know, the sidewalk cafe. I always hated that guy who, who uh, yeah, if he ever listens to this, I still hate him. He, you know, he always would like, the British guy can play at three in the morning. 
So I'd always have to wait until, you know, <laughs> 10 hours later, I'd be sitting there just waiting to play like one song. It was like such a dick about it. He was always a dick. Um, and then I remember being doing these over mics and like Regina Spector would play and Adam Green would play. And uh, they were great. And I remember this one guy just saying, yeah, who, who's, who wants to play an open mic at the Raven Cafe? He just stood up and just said it. And, uh, and then the Raven Cafe became this open mic place. And then that's when sort of lots of open mic, you know, people would sing on the open mic. And Regina and Adam would do a lot there. And I think Elliot went to college with Adam, right? Did you go to college with Adam? Yeah, we were in the same freshman year. Uh, then he left. I heard a story that he got kicked out because because he hid dead fish under the couch in the common room. I don't know if that's true. <laughs> Who knows? <laughs> that's what someone told me. Sounds about right. And then I guess... Um, yeah, but he went on to do better things. Yeah. Didn't he? yeah. And the open mics were good because they were they were they were like the perfect um, moment for like artists sort of trying to figure out their music. I mean, it was you know Adam would sing about cheeseburgers, and Regina was much more refined. She was just already in a league of her own, of her own then. In what oh, she was this doing, this was like two thousand, two thousand one, when was two thousand, yeah, two thousand. It would have been it would have been ninety nine, two thousand because I wasn't quite living in New York at the time. I was still upstate. And I would I would come down on Metro North and I would just do like Wednesdays and Mondays and just any open mic that was available. And then I would get up and to sing two songs that would just sound so British. And uh, the, you know, just nobody liked them. And it was awful. And um, but it was good because everybody talked and everybody watched you, and it was kind of really organic. And then obviously 2001 comes in and you know, the strokes just sort of started everything off. They'd obviously been kicked for a couple of years. Well, didn't, didn't you go there, that, that uh, residency at the Mercury I did. Lounge? I went to... Right I went before to, there. Yeah, so a friend of mine, I had like one friend in New York, one proper friend, Ethan, who, who was actually in a great... He's a great artist called Baby Dayliner, still around. And um, he, he was like, hey, I'm playing bass in this band called The Candy Darlings. And, uh, and we're supporting the Strokes and they're doing like this residency at the Mercury Lounge. And I, I, first off, I, I had never heard of the Strokes. I'd never heard of the Candy Darlings and I'd never heard of the Mercury Lounge. And I just sort of went, uh, I went down there, you know, Ethan put me on the list. It was like literally Studio 54 trying to get in. I was like, I, I'm just on the list here. I, you know, I, I, I'm just coming to see this band play. I don't know who this, this other band, the, the headline band are. And I got in, it was just so packed. And the Candy Darlings played. And then I, uh, you know, I waited and the strokes came on. And it was like this sort of moment where you're sort of like, man, they've got it all together. They've got like the perfect drum head with the logo and they all look the part and they just look like a proper crew, you know, proper gang. And it was so deflating. It was like so depressing. <laughs> it was so depressing yeah. because they were so good. And I sort of watched most of the set and then I had to leave. I just couldn't handle it. I was like, I, I can't handle this. This is just, <laughs> this is the worst experience I've ever felt. Yeah. And like, it was just like, people were going crazy. And you could tell there was a vibe, you know, you go into like 2A and people were like, yeah, the strokes are playing down, you know, they're going to be playing. Like and it was just sort of a, a thing which, um, we were far behind. We were just not, you know, that didn't, it didn't happen to a lot, quite yeah. a bit later. Um, it was funny. I, I, okay, I don't have a, this is not a similar story, but I, I think it was right when the Strokes first EP came out. And so I'd never heard of them. And um, I was at some like 80s night club thing or whatever. Um, I was in college and then some girl started talking to me. She's like, you look like you're in the strokes. And I was like, who the fuck are they? And I was like, I assumed because like so, so many bands, she's like, you know, the strokes. And then um, so many, I, I didn't like any main, like popular bands at that time. I only listened to like bands from like the 60s, 70s and 80s, maybe like a couple of indie bands. And so I was, I was just thinking it was like an insult. And then so later the, the, um, I think the next day or whatever, I was like, oh yeah, I'm gonna look up that band. And I was like, oh fuck. I was like, <laughs> these guys are 
This is my. This is what I want to do. How do they find four other people that are into this? Uh, you know. So, it was, but it was like it was great. It was great in a way. I'm like, oh shit, this is this is like they get they're touring England and stuff. They're going to Europe. This is mm -hmm. awesome. Like I I want to do that. Like how the you know the rest of but like I only know like three other people that play music that that have any the same interest in music that I do. So, and that was like, I ended up moving to New York like right after that. And that's when I met, met Anthony. So it was kind of like, it was probably right around when he saw them play at the Mercury Lounge. So it was, you know, it was kind of a, like they weren't, because they were only slightly older than us, they were more like, I saw them more as peers, you know, but it was sort of that thing where I'm like, well, fuck it. If this is at all possible, I thought I was just gonna, you know, just sit around and dream about being in a band that would play good music but if there are other people if there are other people that like are into this stuff then i'm gonna go find them so yeah i got so i got someone close i found that too. <laughs> <laughs> well that was a that was just a really i think that was the special time because you know that was definitely the vibe you might you know i'm sure the same thing was going on in the uk i remember doing a demo this was just i did this i don't know how i got it i don't know how i did it get it got it done but i asked i somehow found gordon Raphael's like contact details and i asked to do a demo if i could do a demo with him and I, we did this demo and was this was his pre is this it this is this was no no, no this was this is after is this it because oh, right. i knew he was like you know hot you know and i just asked him look can i can i do a demo this was before Elliot and Nader. And I just did this one thing. It was terrible, but we did it. And um, I remember him calling me. He'd like, hey, man, it's, it, these mixes sound great, but I'm in the UK right now. And I've got to tell you, I'm producing this band right now. They are better than the Beatles. They're called the Libertines. And, you know, I guess what was happening in in the uk was sort of slightly happening in a way differently but in a way that was happening in new york i guess maybe that was a, I can't, I'm, the timelines are a little bit skewed right because um i just don't remember but obviously the strokes were, were pre all of that but it only it was only several months six or seven months later that things kicked off for bands the sort of wave in the uk was the libertines came around you know, and they created a created a, 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 a the same type of vibrancy. You know that was going on in New York. Um, it's amazing how that happens. Just it's kind of crazy how that happened. That sort of organically. But that's how I remember it. And it, it took us a couple more years to kind of really get things together, right? Well, you probably have a better yeah idea of time. Yeah. I don't know. We were the, we were in England in two thousand three. So yeah. Our first shows, well, yeah. I remember we couldn't even get shows in Mercury Lounge. We couldn't, they wouldn't, nobody, the guy wouldn't book us there. It was it Johnny Beach? Lovely guy. Became very friendly with him. But he just was like, look, man, I don't know who you are. You know, nobody knows who you are. You know, and, and, and nobody cares. So it was like, okay, well, yeah. I'm going to have to start. He sounds playing. lovely. Yeah. <laughs> he became lovely after we started bringing some people. And then um, I think of, what did we, where did we play our first places? What was the, what was the first place we played? Lit. Yeah, we had a residency at Lit, which is on what? It's like Second Avenue. Avenue Second Avenue, like Sixth Street or something. Again, Sixth. another place that I don't, you know, I, I'm, I haven't lived in New York in six or seven years, so could be gone. I have no idea. Definitely gone. Definitely gone. Is that a common thing in America then where you play a residency? Like, I don't think that happens much. Or happened much in England by the sounds of it. I don't know. It, right? it seemed like a thing of that time period. A bit yeah. like this what would happen. So I have You're no idea. Like every Thursday night or something. Yeah. I don't know. It's, it. it's kind of cool. I, 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 I don't know. I liked it. It's because it's like, you know, if you can't make one show, it does mean it's like it'll be scattered, you know. So if, if, if you're not that popular, you won't. It will, every night will look kind of empty but um you know if some people can't see you one night they can see you another night it's kind of gives people something to do mm. that was a fun oh, vibe. i was into it that was a really fun vibe place to play it was like a dungeon you know you play it but afterwards just they just play all the music you love you know they play like the zombies i <laughs> 
I just remember having good times with Elliot there. I do I remember that sort of that bar at the back in the basement, you know? There'd be that sort yeah. of bar, a little high up bar, and the guy would sort of be serving drinks down to you in a way. It was kind of it was just a great, it was a great thing. It was and then there was sort of Don Hills, which was fun. You'd always play a show before they did like an 80s night. I mean, that was they were very fun times. And uh what other great venues were there? Other, I mean, Mercury was a more of a professional. Great venue. Type. I can name the venues. I don't know if I've labeled them as great. Uh, there's R- Rothko was Rothko one we played was a few good. times. Like We Are Scientists and those bands. Um, I don't, North Six in, in Brooklyn, we played there. Yeah. yeah. Anyway. Sorry, we're going back to the tent, but that's what we did. You know, we, did, we played all the venues. That's what, we definitely played all of them. I suppose, like, we're not really spoke to a band. <laughs> the hard kind of you seem to have like one foot in the English scene and one foot in the New York scene was that kind yeah. of a uh, position yeah. you were in a little bit yeah yeah I mean I think we would earlier Ellie and I would talk about it we'd be like sometimes we go to the UK and we'd have like busy busy shows you know um and then sometimes we'd play New York and it wasn't that busy and then the exact opposite would happen it was just really strange and we could never figure yeah, out yeah. whether we were popular in the UK or the US. And actually, you know, it just, it's, it's all a roll of the dice anyway, but. Very different, very, very different scenes. Very different, yeah. For, for, for how similar, like, in t- like people probably liked kind of the sim- same kind of music, but it was just, New York was, I don't, I don't know how to describe it. Was, it was just kind of more adult you know, like 21 plus venues, like if you have to be over 21 to come up with a lot of these venues, that, that cuts out so many people. Like, mm-hmm. like none of the Paddingtons could even get into a venue in New York. Um, <laughs> and like things like that. And then London, you know, you go, it's like, oh, this is like, this is more, of, New York, it still felt like a subculture. There's so many people in New York that a subculture could still have like 500 people coming to a show, but it felt just more like, woven into the fabric of, of, of England, you know, which is why I like, I've always, you know, so, so, so much music from me, you know, I love, I kind of grew up mm-hmm. listening to. So it was, I mean, I was excited. I think Anthony, was, I don't know what he wanted, but was it less exciting for you to go to England? Than, I'm sure it was. Actually, you know, no, because, you know, you, it was always, I think the first thing we, the first time we, where we play, where do we play first? We play, we played like the Dublin Castle or something first. Something yeah. weird like that, yeah. and then the only the, the real kickoff was was when we played ninety three feet east with the Paddingtons and the Rakes. That was the oh, first. Was, I can't remember. Yeah, that was a great night. That was, That's a good venue. Was that, was that still around? I met you. Yeah, yeah. Oh, is, it, cool, cool is, it, is it? I think it is. Yeah, it's there. But that was. A, I remember um, meeting you boys first, and I was like, oh boy, this is going to be trouble. <laughs> and uh, it was very much so. And we, uh, I think that was a tour. Was that a tour we did there with 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 the pads then, and the rakes? Mm-hmm. That a little tour? Yeah. Did, did we do? Uh, did we do a full tour together as uh, the three bands? Yeah, it was like an enemy thing, I think. Yeah, we did. It was a mm. no. That was that was later. That was with uh, Louis the Fourteenth. I thought they were both enemy. Who knows? Enemy puts their name. Oh on yeah, maybe, maybe it was another enemy thing. I, I don't remember. Fuck. But I do remember that. I remember that. I don't know where we played after that. We did like. I remember the Union in Brighton and like the Concord too. All the old venues, but it was great going up north. It was great going and playing like the cockpit and what was that place that you said, the Joseph Wells? Was, it, was that in Leeds? That was in Leeds. Yeah. I don't remember playing in like Manchester or anything. I can't remember, but yeah, they were great tours. So, I mean, you're gonna get this. I, I don't know. If we you were. Remember. What are you about? Are you about to tell a story? <laughs> no, no, no. I don't know. I don't know if I can remember any other stories. Can I was I just gonna say that we were doing. But the thing is, we were doing tours that it seemed like only we were playing pretty small towns in England. Like it seemed like we were doing tours that 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 English bands were doing or British bands, you know. Like it wouldn't, you know, the bands from most bands from New York weren't coming and playing, I don't know, Hartley Pool or whatever, 
like oh we were God. just going all over the place. So uh, that that made uh, it felt like we we're when we were in England. It felt like we we're an English band, and then we're, <laughs> I think because, because of just I, where we were playing. I agree. I think also it was because we we got affiliated to to um to the English bands quite quickly. We became very friendly, obviously, with the Paddingtons, and very friendly with the Rakes. Um, who else were we friendly with? <laughs> We were friendly with a few bands, and uh, you know that it was an English, that was quite a big English crowd. I mean, like places like I remember being quite jaded when even the Macbeth sort of kicked off. Do you remember that? We were mm. sort of already kind of over, like we toured like the UK a billion times, you know, and it was like right, the Macbeth is like a new venue. We were like, really? And now everybody talks about it. I was like, yeah, the Macbeth was like a wild place. It was great. I was like, right. I was like, yeah, but it was like sort of, I don't know, also pretty shit. I don't know. <laughs> but how did those tours come about? Like, who was funding your travel to England, or was that all kind of off your own back? A credit card. A credit right, card was funding you. A, a credit card that uh, no longer exists. Um, <laughs> no, but it, 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 they weren't easy. I remember we 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 would do we started sort of obviously in a sort of transit van, you know you'd shove like twenty five people in it, uh, you know whoever it was. I mean we didn't have any roadies, but um, at the time at the, start. Really, at the start, yeah. I was going to say well our our manager was British and our booking agent was British. I guess we our booking agent happened to be British, but like that's so it's like we can get you lots of stuff over here. You just got to come over here. You know, yeah. so we're like we, we got you a tour with like the rakes and the Pactons. Just got to come over here. Uh, so then we're like, all right, we'll just scrap it together. We'll all literally just ride in we'll, as like on top of amps and a rental van. So it's super dangerous. It was, I remember <laughs> we got stopped in Brighton. The cops were like, how many people are in this van? And it was like three people in the front and like, five people in the back like lying on like a duvet on the on the on the all the amps and they were like he was like do you know how illegal this is it was like everybody is gonna yeah. have to get a fucking train back to london and uh, we did that like for i don't know like two years before we got called in and it's just not a good idea but we had no choice yeah. we didn't have <laughs> i mean i didn't mind i didn't really think about that duvet was pretty comfortable you know you if, as long as all the <laughs> as long as the amps are even it's not that bad I didn't think about what would happen if the if the van flipped over, but <laughs> I, I slept a lot in that van, so I mean I was fine. <laughs> I drove a lot. You slept a lot. I like that. Yeah, I was like, I can't. Sorry, you guys you chose drive to drive. UK. You guys chose to drive on the wrong side of the road. So don't look for me. <laughs> I'm not gonna do any driving. That's 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 your decision. I think the first, by the way, I don't want to go too on too many tangents because it's just probably disorganized. I got to tell you that the most grueling tour we did was probably the first tour we did. We did like 46 shows in 42 days or something. So that's the, I, I, even now I remember those, the, that time frame. I don't know whether that's exactly right, but it was pretty like full on tour. I remember we toured with the Paddington's. Toured the rakes. We toured with Brendan Benson. We toured with. I think bravery. we toured bravery on that tour. Or, maybe, uh, but it was such a brutal tour. And I remember getting to. I remember. I remember getting to the top of in, top of. Uh, you know, we we had gone all the way north. We got we got to. I think the Glasgow and Barfly, and I remember we'd started the tour. You know, forty days before whatever it was. And we were sort of kind of a little bit loose and things went wrong, you know, strings broken, you know, in the middle of a set and we weren't really prepared. And by the time we got to Glasgow, even though we were still pretty disheveled, you know, we were very comfortable with things going wrong. We'd become very relaxed about anything happening. So it made you into much more of a, you, you were just well, what's the word? I mean, you were just we just we just done you know we just done so much by that point that it was sort of so routine but it flowed so so well uh it, it just it just felt great by the end of it but you were just exhausted you know those tours were just brutal they were brutal <laughs>
So what about in terms of songwriting and like the 14 songs that are on that first album, how did they kind of come about and when were they written? I mean, Anthony is, is the, the songwriter. We were collaborative um, as far as like arrangements and, you know, uh, we would all sort of write our own parts on our instruments and then kind of work on the arrangement together. But, you know, the, the, I would try to throw in some harmonies, but Anthony Good would on. write the, ly- the lyrics and the, thanks, Tom, uh, the lyrics. No, and that was the, me. That was me. I said that. Oh. <laughs> Tom, we're, we're, why, why didn't Tom say it? Um, <laughs> <laughs> I agree. Uh, I wasn't looking. I was, I was looking. I was reminiscing. Um, no, but so what's funny is that we, we recorded that album um, and then really heavily toured for two years while we were like working to get it put out. So we had the mm-hmm. recording. Yeah, And what I realized, though, by the end of it, after touring for two years like that nonstop, yeah. you're kind of a different band. Like those songs just sounded different. Yeah. So by the time by the time we I mean, it was well recorded. We recorded with the uh, Eli Janney in, in New York. And it was it sounds great. It just it doesn't. I think if you had seen us live after playing that much, especially touring, you know, all around England, and then you heard the album, I felt like there was probably something that wasn't i don't know if there's anything specific with the our style of playing or anything like that but my say i was like if i had to do that over again i would record the album after all the touring not like before yeah yeah yeah, yeah. the same with those the same with those in our first albums well i always think that because like um yeah once you've taught it so many times like you you just it you come out with better ideas, hundred percent. I would, I'd love to actually record first comes first again. Yeah. yeah, I mean that sounded that sounded great. Um, yeah, it did sound great. I, I think I think you're right. You know, but we just spent so much time in rehearsal rooms, just continually rehearsing. And um, that is and true. We did. Yeah, on. in New York, we were doing it like every day. It's it's. New York, that's the other thing about New York. It's like, man, you really have to, if you want to be in a band in New York, you really, you, I mean, you have to want it. You really have to want it because yeah. everything's a pain in the ass. Unless you happen yeah. to own a, like a loft space or something, like mm-hmm. getting, getting everywhere is a pain in the ass. Uh, we had to like rent rehearsal spaces by the hour, things like that. Um, I mean, the cost adds up and just, just getting drums to a venue, <laughs> huge, huge fan <laughs> I mean, I guess you could say the same thing about London, but I feel like London still has a little bit more space than, than New York yeah. at the time. But but also we 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 did it from Hull as well, so we we were pretty lucky in that sense to be fair, because we we started from like my my dad's workshop that he ran his business from. Do you know what I mean? So like yeah yeah like that part of the fucking problem isn't it when you're starting you don't have the money to do shit yeah no, yeah no. i think it was like it was funny you know years later i remember doing like a rehearsal in where was that place we used to rehearse all the time Al? do you remember the vent remember the rehearsal space it was still there uh i don't it was remember like the name 36 of it, it was nine yeah it was yeah it was in fucking no man's land it was, it was by <laughs> madison square garden um, I just yeah, I remember you, you had to. I mean, you had to take an elevator up to like the thirtieth <laughs> floor or something to rehearse. Oh god! Do you know what we we when we came to New York, we rehearsed in this rehearsal spot, and it was fucking. It was yeah. It was about fifty floors up, and we were like, how the yeah. fuck do people rehearse here? <laughs> yeah, you, you get the whole floor. It's cool. It's so weird. Yeah, you get off at the wrong floor, and it's like a sweatshop. And like, whoops, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that's so true. <laughs> oh man. Did it end up coming out on your own record label? Is that right? Yeah, we put out an EP first, right? Did we we did like a head games EP. Yeah, that we did Elliot's, an EP. That was that was that was sort of the thing we sold on tour, right? But the, I mean Eddie's artwork was like always the most formidable. It was like the best. He like did I this mean, artwork for like head games. I was like, bro, put that out as an EP. And we put it out. And it was good, you know, it was like, 
I don't know what it did. It sort of gave some presence to the to the band itself, obviously. But we just didn't. I didn't know how to get an outlet for any of this. You know, I didn't really know how to go. Who who, who is that? Who is that? You saying? I didn't. I did, well, we just did the who, EP who, first. No, who were you saying about the artwork? I didn't know how. Oh, Elliot, Elliot did all the artwork for. Oh, did for, you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, oh, yeah, right. yeah. It was so good. I mean, for free, it was good. <laughs> yeah, it was good. It was, it was good. Get out for free. And then, but we we put the album out in the UK on our own. Did we? Did we put the out? Um, what did we do? I, we'll play it again, Sam. I don't know. Is that you? This thing is like I didn't pay attention to any of this stuff. So, I don't. So we, I, we, I was like, Ant, Anthony's got it covered. I don't know. I don't. No I, I think we, we what we did was we put out the EP and then a little while later, well, quite a while later, as Elliot said, like two years later, um, we we put out the, the record. We got signed to play it again, Sam, P, uh, PS, in Europe. And then they 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 had this uh, label called some bullshit. I don't know what it was in the UK. Well, and then they were like, well, you can have your own imprint and we'll distribute it through this thing. Um, through this label we have. It was called something, I don't know. Uh, and then they would do that. They would say, right, you can re- you can name it your label and we'll distribute it for you. And Played Against Sam, I think, owned them in the UK. Or they, there was some sort of, you know, some sort of connection there, partnership. And simultaneously, they were released together in Europe and the UK on... Um, uh, on glaze in the uk and then ps in in europe and now then then europe sort of opened up to us a little bit you know that was really good because then we started doing tours in europe which was really yeah. that was that became a bit a bit different from us that took us away from the paddingtons which was after the two years of like <laughs> two years of like full-on uk touring it took us away from doing a, a lot of the uk and going deeper into europe um because PS had a really good presence in Europe, I think. Yeah, and that was, I mean, that like our, out of, out of all the places, I felt like we were, we made our biggest mark in, in the Netherlands. Yeah. Just randomly, I think one of the, one of the rock DJs. No, no, no. Was this, this is, no what was it? This is, the, this is the story. This is how this went down. <laughs> this is how it went down. Elliot was fucked up one night at 333. And he runs into the manager of the Strokes, Ryan Jennels, at the time was the manager of the Strokes. And he's like, yo, man, what's up? Uh, the Alabama Jim is touring the, the Europe for the next three weeks or four weeks or whatever. And he's like, and the, uh, the opening band had pulled out. And, uh, and can you do it? And we were in the UK and we had two weeks before we were going to Japan. That was right. I remember this. This was 2006, five or six, something like that. And... And Elliot's like, uh, I think so. And so he just calls me and I'm like, what are we doing for the next two weeks? Okay, well, when we just jumped on the Albert Hammond Jr. tour, which our timing was perfect because PS were putting out a single for Time On My Hands, which was the song on um, the first record. And that came out uh, the same, ex- almost exactly the same time as that tour with Albert, which we supported Albert, his first like... Um, solo tour and yeah. that song just just you know went straight you know did very well in europe in, in holland and that was that was it it started the ball rolling you know for us in europe did you already have a relationship cool. with the strokes and that kind of crew already no not really it was that period right we, 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 i mean yeah yeah, yeah yeah ryan was drawn to elliot ryan always thought I, elliot was the, you know i thought i always felt like he was drawn to you I don't know you. I thought you uh, talked to those guys all the time. I know you. You, you and Ryan would talk business at that period. Yeah, I thought you had like a relationship with Julian as well. Didn't, didn't you used to play poker with Julian? Or something? That was a little later. We, we, yeah, we was a little later where we. He came to a couple, of, a couple of it, but he didn't come to that many. But Ryan would always put these poker games on, which I would always lose. You know, fucking anything I'd ever earn on those games because everybody just rinses you. <laughs> and uh, you know, but that was a little later. But that tour was initially was the album was that was the first bit, and I think then me and Ryan became really pretty pretty close. Um, still are, you know, and um, and 
um, and to this day, you know, still, yeah, I'll admit we're very close. He just had a kid, actually. Um, and um, yeah, but that was a bit later. But in 2006, those were the tours. I mean, they were great tours. They were fun tours, right, man? They were good. Yeah, I mean, we had we 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 nicked your sound guy, Tom. We had Simon. Oh uh, uh, yeah, I remember, I remember that. Yeah. So he came. So he was. He's like a little genius, and so he, mm-hmm. you know, he was great and helpful. And we had like a proper bus for the first time ever. That was nice. Um, yeah, I don't know. That was that was that was that was like an, an, another era where it's like, okay, cool. Like yeah, I, we actually, I don't have to, not, it's not quite, you know, not quite as a, a strain on the system as, as what we're, a lot of this stuff. And I think about this and just in general about that area, uh, era, man, there's some unsustainable activity going on just in general, <laughs> every way you can think of it, like just the way we're, the way we're touring, what, how we were, I mean, you think if we were eating, yeah, like okay, you're driving in a, a van like six hours a day, like sleeping on amps. You got to make up for it by like, you know, getting rest and eating well. It's like, no, we'll, I'm going to, there'd be days where the only thing I ate was the hummus in the rider. Um, <laughs> and then like, and then I remember every time, I'm sure this is the case with you guys too, but every time without fail, we'd get the, the rider and it'd be like 48 beers or something of Carlsberg or some shit beer. And shit beer. we'd look at it, we go, holy shit, the, this is 48. We're not going to finish these. And then every time without fail, we'd be like, can we have more beer? Um, <laughs> it was so actually like the like, Bruce Brothers show. It was like the Bruce Brothers show where he's like, you drank more yeah. beer than you've earned money. That happened to us in, in Oslo. Remember, they, they were like, we don't have a writer, but this is a bar. So you can just get, you can just come and get a drink. And then we stayed there and they're like, please leave, please leave. <laughs> Like 12 people came. <laughs> you guys have been drinking for six hours. It's three in the morning. Please leave. We've lost so much money. Uh, but there are Norwegians that they, they had to be nice. But they were nice about it. Um, yeah. <laughs> we had a yellow bus. Uh, then. It was a double decker yellow bus. And I remember being in the bar <laughs> in Oslo with Elliot. And the bartender goes, it, like really serious it was like we do a shot yeah and the only one because this is very strong and i was like just give me the shot bro you know just just, just let's just do the shot and i remember we did a shot and of course we've been drinking for like you know several hours already and he was like okay just just one more one more and i remember just mouthing something to him and doing the shot and then 20 minutes later just complete blackout i i don't remember anything i just remember waking up in, in the bus just to, you know that, he's that probably, yeah, he's probably so trying to crazy get us out of there. It's like, fine, I'll just have to knock him out myself. I think it was Aquavit, Aquavit we were drinking. Oh, I remember all those. But just, get, by the way, before that Europe part, man, those UK tours, just to go back to that, like just the venues and themselves, like the Oxford Zodiac, I do remember, if I'm going to just say, I remember the Paddington's just fucking getting thrown out of that shit. I remember that. Do you remember the tattoo-ridden <laughs> fucking bouncer fucking trying to like, uh, beat the fuck out of yeah. everyone? He was oh, like a redneck. Oh my God. They had those in England? That was, uh, Regina Speck was playing downstairs at the Oxford Zodiac. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And yeah, we yeah. were playing I remember that. And, and, uh, <laughs> and I remember um, we came downstairs, we were making a little bit too much noise, and she had a habit of telling everybody in the room, like, could you guys shut the fuck up? And everybody would have to be really quiet. And um, maybe we were being a bit noisy. Uh, and I just remember someone of the Paddingtons getting to an altercation with this guy who had tattoos. He was like a bouncer who had tattoos all over his face. And then, you know, they just threw us all into this some, some fucking alleyway. Was, I, you know, they just threw us all out or whatever. I don't know what, what happened, but it escalated to a point. I feel like it had to be Grant. I Grant, think it was yeah. Grant. I think it was Grant. Grant was like mouthing something to him. That guy was like, he was fucking on fire. Yeah. <laughs> that, that was like the most touring with the Paddingtons, you know. I, mean, I know you guys already did a podcast, but that, that's like 
for me, it's like, this is the most uniquely fucking English thing that we're doing. Like, <laughs> it's just, it's just I, I'm like, holy mm-hmm. shit, we're like touring with the, some like Dickens orphans. Um, I, I remember Dickens. Tom, <laughs> it's Tom and, and, and Marv, I, I, I couldn't, I think for the first three weeks we toured together, I was like, I don't understand a word they're saying. I don't, I don't, <laughs> like, but we, we would get drunk, we would get, we get, we get drunk after the show and like have conversations and I don't even know, somehow we talked about stuff and we're like, yep, yeah, he gets me, but I, I don't know what he said. Uh, yeah, that, but it was, it was just, it was very, it's like trying to, I mean, I don't know if it's, this probably doesn't seem that weird to you, know, you guys growing up north and stuff, but I was like, this is this is crazy. This is these people up here are crazy. Um, yeah, it was fun though. I love. I've always I've always been more. You know, I've I've drawn to the the northern crowd. Than yeah, the for sure. Crowd, but. but then what about um, the rescue rooms? Uh, Nottingham rescue rooms was a good venue to play, man. That was a good vibe. I remember mm. there's just a lot of fun times in in that venue, and just yeah. uh, great tours. Oh yeah, I, yeah. Sorry, I'm just thinking about it now. I haven't thought about it for fucking years, but it's just great. Sorry, I know we went back to the remember. UK, but it's much more. The UK was much more exciting. I remember just. Oh yeah, sorry. I, I'm going to go off on tangents all the time, but uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, mine. That's all right. But um, so you say it's more exciting. Was there a more of a Kind of community in England, do you think, compared to New York? Because when after meeting me in the bathroom book came, oh, like, yeah. the Strokes kind of dismissed any idea of a real scene in New York. Like, what are your guys' takes on it? I, I, I you know, yeah. I think I'm, I'm going to agree with them a little bit on that. When you really think about it, like what a scene is, it's uh, there were a lot of bands, but and in New York, but I don't know. There's just I'm not gonna be able to put it into words correctly. So it's more about what I described before. Where, and first of all, so many people are transplants, like me included. I grew up in Washington D.C., um, so it's not. I, I know, like all the Strokes are from New York. There's other a lot of bands. You know, some people are from New York, but a lot of people just aren't. And just that alone, you know, makes it not not a community really. Yeah, um, and also they were the beginning. So it was really, they were the first. I mean, I'm not sure there was a, much of a scene when they began. It was almost just like they gave birth to it. Really, wasn't it? So like yeah. They, and they, they, didn't, they, they, they probably they didn't, didn't feel a part of it because. Yeah. Years later, when we when I was, we, we became a lot more, a lot closer to them, we would spend a lot of time together. It, it was def- very much like that because they, they just didn't really see any of that happening because they were too busy working. They would, mm. you know, what if you, what we were doing in two thousand and one and two, at Lit Lounge or two thousand three, uh, you know, at any of these venues, they were already, you know, traveling the world continually, um, mm. and so they just sort of they didn't that, that having a conversation with them about that period, they won't even they won't even remember that. They'll be like, oh, well, we were fucking, you know, yeah. in Brazil. Like, you know, we were headlining <laughs> Reading. You know, you know, it didn't make any difference to them. Also, um, yeah, in, in Manhattan in Manhattan, it's so expensive that I think when uh, one once once Williamsburg and Brooklyn started to like swell up, that was more of a scene. So that was more like yeah. electro clash and stuff. And you know, like Bands like Grizzly Bear and things like that. I felt like that was more of like a community. But yeah, that wasn't, we, we weren't really part of that either. <laughs> floating, <laughs> we were perpetually right. floating, <laughs> perpetually floating in no man's land. That's perpetually floating. Our band. Yeah. So, yeah. So now we can go back to Europe if you want to. Which is, I kind of, <laughs> so, what you're saying you had a better time in general in, in Europe and the UK? Uh, no, we had some good nights in the. <laughs> We had some good nights in New York, but it was much more flow. There was much more flow to to the UK and Europe. There was you actually getting things done. Um, you know, you'd play a show in New York, and but you we weren't touring the US because you just need more of. It's just so hard. You can't do that without real um, release and, and money. And so our focus was 
was trying to uh, yeah, there was just much more prof- I mean some form of professionalism towards the UK and Europe and releasing things. Yeah, I mean in UK we 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 could get on MTV too. We could get on BBC Radio. We could actually you know, we had stuff to look forward to. We could, it's like, you can't get on the radio in New York unless you're, you know, Foo Fighters, like, uh, <laughs> or the main, you, you know, yeah. or, or, or MTV, God forbid, I don't, first of all, MTV doesn't play music anymore, but like having your music video in the States was just, that was so far from, we would have had to, we would have had to like, <laughs> you know, be number one in England for the America to even be like, okay, maybe we'll take a look at it, you know? Yeah. So. We we covered so many of the small towns in the UK as well. Like mm. it's like the difference between the UK and, and the US was like you got all the little places that are just absolute. They're just gagging for like bands to come to the cities, which we did. Like like you were saying, like when we're doing fifty shows on a tour, do you know what I mean? Just covered literally the whole country. Yeah, I will say that's another thing. That's, I'm glad you brought that up. But- because when you play to people in New York, they're all sort of standoffish, you know, they don't want to, they're not like that sort of earnest sort of enthusiasm is just not there. Yeah. Um, right. Even if they like you, but then you, you we play, you know, Hull and it's like, you know, everyone, there's in no Venice. pretense. Every, every, everyone's just, yeah, in Inverness. People, oh they go, God. they go, they like go nuts and like throwing themselves through windows and shit. It was out of it. It was fucking out of control. They haven't seen people. Yeah, up yeah. There. So, it's like seven people. I'm like, oh, there. cool. Like, yeah, it's a band. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that, that's what, you know, you, you can sort of, if you can, if you, if you think about playing venues to 10 people uh, and like, that's your job, it kind of sounds, you know, not great sometimes, but, but then you to think like the, you, the 10 people that show up, I mean, we didn't. We weren't always playing in front of ten people, but every now and then it would happen. Um, they were they were so psyched to see you, and they're so nice, and like it was a highlight of their day. So you know, yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's it's great. It's for anyone who's worked just a normal job. No one's nice to you. Everyone, you know, it's like <laughs> no, I've don't. done it. I've done it. I've worked. I've worked so many shitty jobs offhand. You know, like I'm like, oh man, remember when I was touring and everyone was nice to me? That was great. <laughs> Instead, now everyone's just mad at me. Uh, so you know that, that 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 enthusiasm in England was great. That I think that was part of why it was exciting and fun. Yeah. So um, then moving on to second album type thing, like oh shit, Elliot, what? <laughs> Elliot, this is gonna, what get, this gonna get awkward. <laughs> this is gonna get awkward. <laughs> we don't. Um, we don't have. To, we don't have to linger on the second album too long. Fair it's going to get all good for, for, for both parties involved. <laughs> to a point where you left Elliot, obviously, like what? Um, yeah. What was the build up to that? Were you what writing happened? songs for the second album up to that point? Yeah. Well, the thing is, we were, I think it was just exhaustion, you know, when you're looking back on it. Like we were nonstop touring um, for like four, four years or whatever. And then it was like, all right, we're writing these new songs. And I think, you know, who knows? I can, I can, I can only speak from my perspective, but it was like, it's one of those things where you're like, I remember we were sitting in, and we, were, we booked a, like a rehearsal space in, in Amsterdam. Um, and so we lived in Amsterdam for like a month and we were, just basically, we were just writing and stuff like that. And yeah, I mean, I was smoking weed. I wasn't smoking that much, but I mean, you're, another one whatever um and it it was just felt felt grueling i remember being like i should be having so much fun right now like this should be everyone this sounds like a dream like i'm in a band and we're living in Amsterdam writing an album this would be amazing Uh, but i was like i was like this is i'm just tired you know Mm. i wasn't i wasn't so it's one of those things where it's like I don't think I can do it. I can't do this next album. It's not one of those things where you really, when you think about the decisions that you make, you don't think like super long term. It's sort of sort of like, yeah, I'm, I'm I can't do this. I can't do this if we're gonna like be have to tour like that again for the mm. next three years. So you know, because we were in our, I was 26 at the time, and what's funny is that I was like, I'm already old as shit. 
<laughs> you know, that's that's what I thought. I'm like, I'm already so old. Like, what if like I need to like figure out what what's exactly going on? You know, what am I? What am I? Wait, what am I doing with my life? Like, is this gonna? How's this gonna pan out? Probably th- overthought it. You know, but that's what happens when you're that kind of. That's what I was saying. The the unsustainable lifestyle that we had at the time, and then so, yeah. but but Anthony is 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 a stubborn guy and, and he's like i'm putting out this fucking album no matter what which is fine um and but he can he can talk to uh, he can talk to that I'm, you know i wasn't i was i didn't want him to not put out the album i was like yeah go for it keep going i just like i can't you know i need to break he's right i mean we basically were just exhausted and also i was just a, a maniac and um the thing was is that you know um you sort of don't, you don't, you, th- you know, it's probably coming, but you don't think it's going to happen because you've been able to to do it for long enough. You're like, ah, we'll ride this out, you know, but actually everybody was so burnt out really. And just, we should have just probably just gone back to New York immediately and taken a break you know, for a good, good long time. And perhaps we never would have done anything after that anyway, but we probably needed just a break. And then, but what happened was because of because of just being a, a lunatic, I just was like, right, let's just 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 do the second album because we'd just been playing the same first album for so long that I thought we've just you know got to try and do a second album quite quickly. Um, and it didn't work out that way. It just we were in Amsterdam doing the rehearsals, and it, it just it wasn't everything was um, just. Uh, it wasn't even friction. It was just like a dullness. Um, I don't remember it being friction. I just remember it being like, you know, you can't, can't really communicate. Um, yeah, it's just like, you know, like anything. Probably could work something out, you know? Like, yeah. but, but when you're, you're younger and you're, you're much more fiery in general, like, yeah, I think we're all, more, we're all more chill now. Um, and you also think, you know, it's like I still love music, you know, I still... I was like, fuck it, you know, like I can, you know, well, in the back of my head, I was like, I'm not going to stop playing music. I mean, well, I'll, I'll still I'll like get back and like do more songwriting of my own, you know, start a band. And then you realize like, it's kind of, it's just hard to find enough people, <laughs> literally just to find <laughs> enough people who, who, who share this, who, who want to be like, all right, I will be in a band with you because such a, you know, it's like a big, it's like marrying someone, you know, there's a lot of, mm-hmm. you're, you're stuck with them forever. So some, in some ways it's, it's easier to just patch up <laughs> what, what, what you already have, but, you know, I don't know. I think with, with you guys, like Paddington's, you know, you guys grew up together. There's more of that. Like you're, you're probably more just entwined than I think we were because we'd met in our early twenties that it wasn't like, mm-hmm didn't have that kind of history so that, it wasn't that crazy to be like yeah yeah Ian, yeah i'm good keep going the fact that we kind of grew up together a bit more it did make a difference yeah and um you know we could we could fall out and make up straight away but was- I, st- I think about it all the time though like you said going back over things like a second album or whatever or the, the time that you kind of call it a day or whatever it's like Oh, I wish I'd go, I wish I could go back and just like do it a little bit different, but no regrets as well. Do you know what I mean, no, because I, you don't. Re- I mean, I don't don't regret any that any of the time we had, but I I do think that we could have taken some space and regrouped. But I think we were just tired when because because Anthony and I met in our early twenties. It's different for you know if bands if they've known each other since they were teenagers or whatever. I feel like. There's more of a of a just your side to the those group of that group of people, you know, rather than if you know you haven't known someone all that long. So I met Anthony, and then with within a few months, we we're just touring, and then that was like it was just it for years, four years. Mm-hmm. So it wasn't like all right, well, let's go back to when we we're just when we we're just mates. It's like the, you know. The, we, we, we barely knew each other before then, so. I will say, though, it was tough because, from my perspective, because 
it was really, really hard to do it with that, Elliot. It's very hard because, um, you know, we were, I, you know, we were very, very close. And I, also from creatively, I mean, yeah, you know, I, I would write the, the, the foundations of the songs, but without arran the arrangement of them, it was like I had nobody to kind of, uh, you know, communicate with on that level anymore. And that's a really hard thing. I mean, I'm sure lots of bands go through that. But um, mm. but the thing, the, 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 the real thing about it was, is that we, I knew that we had momentum in Europe still at that point when things were breaking down. And um, there was nothing I could do about it. You know, I think Nader and Elliot had both decided, you know, they, they just it was enough. And, um, but it was really, really hard not to, not to do it without, specifically without Elliot, because it was more from a, friendship obviously but also was more uh you know it, when we first started playing um it, it was um it was like both of us were i remember us both playing i remember i had this whole mindset that we would both play parallel to each other it wasn't like i was up front singing so it was very hard to do it without it. you know it really was and it was weird because <laughs> when when i did do when i did do the second record of course, you know, there were certain things happened with it, but I couldn't enjoy it um, in the same way. There was nothing, there's no satisfaction to it because, you know, the actual core guys who were really, um, you know, you started the, the whole the whole thing with were gone, you know, they weren't, they weren't there. So it was a very different, different um, approach to it. It, was, it just didn't feel that comfortable. You weren't a gang anymore. You were just, it was just like a, yeah. It got it had already gone, yeah. Was this second was it the second one where didn't you get Aggie involved somehow? Yeah. Yeah, we did a song with Aggie. <laughs> um so the the whole thing was is like uh I don't even know if Ellie uh, knows much of this really, but the whole thing was is that when Elliot and Ellie left, I went I'd spent a little while back in the UK just just chilling out, you know, just there was nothing else to do. And um, and I went back to New York and this producer was like, hey, I'd like to do the second record for the Bible of Heroes. I was like, well, I'll be, it would be good, but, you know, <laughs> uh, we don't, there's no band involved uh, anymore. Um, and he was like, well, you know, just find other guys. So, okay, well, that happened and we put other guys in place. I became friendly with this French artist called Emily Simon at the time. And I'd written this song and, I said she co-wrote it with me. She co-wrote, so she technically co-wrote Who with me because she wrote this sort of female part in the chorus um, that Aggie sings. And she, there's a French version of it that we never released with Emily Simon. And and when we were doing it, we were doing it in the studio, Aggie was living in New York at the time and, you know, just kind of building a, a name and uh, she heard it and it, it wasn't massively strategic but it was like look obviously you know sing on this song it's gonna it's gonna create weight to the whole thing and uh, and that's exactly what happened you know and she sung on it and we did a video and it became very uh, interesting for a few months and and yeah and then it just sort of <laughs> fizzled out it was, it was pretty straightforward but it, I mean, yeah. yeah. I, I hope you. I hope you enjoyed it. <laughs> well, last. Um, you want. You want. Here's the thing. I don't think we have. We have nothing to lose. You want to make this podcast interesting. I mean, the truth. The truth is, like, I, I would never have allowed that to happen. Like, I'd never. I would have. It's true. I, I would have been like. You would no fucking way. We we're not being. We we're not being one of those bands that gets a fucking model to sing. That is so corny. <laughs> also, <laughs> like I don't know. There's it was just a lot of there's a lot of but you know whatever. Like I didn't really care. Um, you know I'm not in the band, so he could do whatever he wants. You know it was always more like his his band than anyone else's. Obviously, you know if he was writing some of the songs before I'd even met him, but I just knew that I was like that that's the I just never would have like we would have <laughs> if 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 we didn't if like if you tried to pull that when i was there like 
that like if I hadn't already left, that would have made me if I'd be like, no way. But you know, <laughs> uh, it, like kind of just entertaining. It is what it is. It's like just another. Uh, at least like we can laugh about it now. You know. Well, they, they hope, definitely uh, they, they the uh, English cut me to pieces for it. I hope you, you made know. some money. The, the English, well, that, you know, that was that's another story. But the English cut me to pieces for it for doing it, and and you know that was that's what happens though. That's why I would have been like, this is what's going to happen. The English are going to cut you to pieces for that. that's what I, I don't wouldn't use those words, but like it just seems so obvious. But you but, the, know. But, but it was interesting because you know he's right. It would never have happened with Elliot and the band. It would never. I would I've never. I wouldn't even have entertained it anyway. You know, I wouldn't even have thought about it. Um, but I think also, um, I just was. You know, it's like fucking when you listen to fucking Paul McCartney without Lennon. I, I mean, it's, it, I know that sounds a fucking terrible comparison because it's Paul McCartney and Lennon. But you know what I mean. The relationship. It's the idea that you write a song, and you know. That if you play it to somebody in the band that you trust and you you can collaborate with some capacity and you have that connection, they're going to tell you whether it's shit or it's good. And at the end of the day, I totally lost that, you know. Mm. And um, it was incredibly hard. That that that's actually the one thing I think about more than anything else of all of the time we had. And um, this is like this, by the way, this isn't this isn't like a podcast. This is like a therapy session at this point. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I think this is what, probably one of the few things people be interested in hearing in this, <laughs> in this podcast. But, <laughs> but I, I think the problem was, is that I just, I, I, you know, if, if you if you kind of if you sit down and analyze it like I have oh. a few times, I could say before I met Elliot. Uh, there was not much of, I mean, I was writing, but there was not much direction of what I was doing. There was no sort of, oh, I don't know how to describe it. And then I meet Elliot and we kind of together create this, this, this thing that works and everybody knows it works and everybody knows it works with us together. Um, and Ada, of course, but, you know, um, but, I think once that stopped, it was very just, there was just no, there was no balance anymore. And on a small scale, that was deeply difficult because you can't, you, there's nothing, where do you go from there? And so after like record two, which we did some touring, um, it was just, uh, you know, I just, I didn't have any more, any more room to go. You know? just, was, but I've I been doing it for a long time, but there was just no room to go. You know, there's nowhere else to to, to 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 go. But I remember, I remember one time me and Elliot got together in New York a little while later. Do you remember this? We we met in a bar like down like Chinatown or something. Uh huh. <laughs> and do you remember this? Sounds, sounds about right. We sat together, and he was like, you know, maybe I'm maybe I should come back. I remember just talking about it slightly. You know, and we played a show like the next week. This is this is this is exactly what Elliot means, because we played a show like the next week, as the you know whatever new guys they were, and and he came to the show, and we were playing effectively the same songs as album one and two, and he was like you know, and I spoke to him after the, after the show or, or maybe like the next day, and he was like you know I can't I can't come back because you're still playing the same shit. You know, you're still doing the same set lists. And I was like, well, yeah, <laughs> because I can't fucking, you know, it was hard to explain, but I was like, of course I am, because we can't sit in a rehearsal room together and do what we used to do. So, yeah. Well, you yeah, left, I, I you, remember you did, that gig. You left too early. That's what you did. You left too early. <laughs> I left too early. I left. Did I leave? Oh, oh the band. Not, yeah. Um, man. Yeah, which well, well, you might you left, you might left that show earlier as well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, 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 yeah, that's so true. I went up there and like it was like the opening chord, the head came. So I'm like, wait, hold on. <laughs> <laughs> we're gonna start over. Just like I'm gonna, we're just gonna pretend like the last three years didn't happen. <laughs> I mean, if I'm if I'm gonna come in at this point, I want we, we should just only be playing show, like songs with models, you know. <laughs> that's just, <laughs> Well, now <laughs> you got to give me some of that Aggie money if I'm going to come back. 
Um, <laughs> she's singing at that, that, that gig you're no, talking no. about. No. She I, did, I like, never saw, I she never did saw like her two, perform. two shows. Oh, she did right, like okay. Two or three shows. I think what happened was, I mean, if we're going to be perfectly, perfectly honest, she was, she, she's an amazing girl, lovely, you know, and we never would have met her if it wasn't for the Paddingtons. Um, and um, she did like, um, she sang on the thing, we did some press and stuff, and then she sung in, she didn't sing in New York, she sang in London, we did something at the Queens of Noise or something, what's that place called in, in the East? Not for yeah. East. We did that, and we did like one other, and the press got so fucking bad, that they were like, you know, if, if people turned to me like, dude, you gotta fucking, you gotta stop this shit because she's actually, she actually has a career, and you're just, de- you're destroying it. <laughs> <laughs> Holy shit! Man. <laughs> and I think, uh, well, <laughs> but can and, I ask a question? I want to ask, I want to ask, uh, <laughs> Harry and Tom a question. What was your impression of that whole, that whole time? I was um, like, we should have I, fucking done that. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, honestly, I don't remember too much apart from the fact that Josh was a little bit upset. <laughs> I think I just found it quite yeah. funny. <laughs> I think the tension between the, you know, the Paddington's at that point probably was enough. I mean, I think uh, you know, I, I don't regret. I don't regret it because it was very. It was very. It taught me quite a few things. Uh, that second record, but it mm. teaches you that. Um, you, you, once you have a good thing going on, like once you really do have a special chemistry, and by the way, I, mean, I hate to say it, and it sounds a bit strange, but the Strokes obviously have that chemistry. There are a handful of bands that have that chemistry, and they always, they never realise it. You know, they don't. I mean, they realise it for money reasons, and they realise it at the beginning, but in the middle, they always forget. And you know, they, the chemistry between people it's just in a band it's just what it, once it works it's just so good mm. and it's just hard to sustain you know even being in like a mildly successful band like like we were <clears throat> it's it's like and I've, I've talked to other you know ex-band people about this and it's like it's like impossible to replace you know yeah like no matter what you go on to do uh and like you know, so, some of us have been lucky enough to do like some some fun stuff, but like it's just there's no replacement. I don't know. I don't know what it is. For some reason, playing to a hundred people that really want to see you, uh, you know, and like and whatever, getting going on a TV show and performing or something like that. Like it's you can't, you can't replace it with, you know, you could go make a million dollars. It doesn't. Those millionaires are like, man, I wish I was in a band, but that's why they all wish that. And that's, uh, that's, that's true. So it's, exactly. and, and you can't, and so you do take it for granted. Even when you're, you're thinking like, well, this isn't my ideal situation. And then, you know, later, you know, you're like, oh, wait, my whole entire life I don't, is not ideal. Like nothing's ideal, you know? Yeah. So you got to, if, if, if it's working a little bit, you should probably be a little more flexible. That's true. It's true. Yes, very true. I suppose at that point as well, Anthony, you're also fighting against the tide of that whole scene kind of dying out a bit. I was just old. I was like, thir- I was by, by that point, I mean, old, I was, I was like 30 and, um, well, I might be 28. I don't know. And I was just like, God, you know, there's nothing else I can do. There's nothing. I've just, I mean, on a level I've done it, I've done it all. And I wasn't, I wasn't dissatisfied with any of it. Actually, the only thing I do miss is that chemistry because there's nothing like walking into a rehearsal room, you know, and <laughs> you just don't, you don't, uh, I would wish that on everyone. You know, that's the one thing I can say is like, I wish them, I wish anybody wants to be in a, in a band, I wish that they feel that because it, there's nothing like it. You know, the pads understand that, the rakes will understand that, uh, the strokes will understand that. You know, um, the, the I definitely uh, I we were very aware of that chemistry, and um, that's all it ever. It's all it's about. I mean, okay, it doesn't last long enough, um, but every band should should vie for that. You know, they should they should want that because then because what happens in that situation is then people come to you, 
You don't have to go to them. They find you, you know, because they can see that you're, that you've got something, you've got some, something between you, um, that they, they want to be involved. They want to get in and they can't get in because they're not in the game. <laughs> you know? But you know, I'm right. You know, it's, yeah, it's, yeah, yeah. it's so true. It's bit, and that's why Elliot's right. It's, it's just irreplaceable. You managed to get another album out. Was it? It's a few years later, 2011. Yeah, but I mean, at that point, fucking Jesus, I didn't even know what it was. That I was like, yeah, let's just put this. Uh, I, I, you know, I, 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 I mean, you did three. I did a third one because I just didn't know what else to do. Um, uh, I think what do I do? It? I did it with Gus Oberg. Malcolm's oh, producer Strokes. Yeah, I did it with Gus, and it was um, I became really friendly with with all of them after, you know, this from about two thousand six seven. We became very close to Gus and Ryan, and you know, guys in the Strokes, and, and we just sort of started to. I don't know. I, uh, I was still playing, and I just <laughs> I don't know what I was doing. I was just still playing, and um, just 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 put a record out that didn't really do anything. It didn't really. Um, but it's like now, you know, I'll still play songs that I probably have to record because if I if I don't, I'm just going to continually play them. And uh, it, sometimes you've just got to release it just to get it off your chest. But yeah. by that point, I uh, I couldn't. Even I couldn't go on the road on that record. And I, I, I definitely, I don't think we went on the road on that record at all. It just came and went, you know? We went for a night out not so long ago to watch The Void. Uh, you were talking about your involvement with publishing, uh, with promised land i think it was i mean i just started getting involved in it quite early on we would re we would release like little things uh at the songs on on uh, on, a la on glaze i think a, a label we did a couple of things we did this band opera house that ended up becoming tribes or something I don't I've know heard of them, yeah. but you know, that was so early on um, and did a few other things. And then I just started to get into involved into publishing a bit. And I started to, you know, we did like Splash. I don't know if you remember that band Splash. They weren't around for long, but they had a... Yeah, they had I a, remember them. Was he they Australian, were, the kid? Yeah. yeah. And he, yeah. going to see them was like, they, that reminded me of our period. You know, yeah, it was very, very Dalston, that one. There's a scene going dull. on at the time. It was like Swim Deep. Uh, yeah. Obviously, Swim Deep were like one of the bigger bands to come out of it, but yeah, and then there was, yeah, there was a lot, yeah, it was quite good actually. Some good yeah. bands happening, and then like another band, Public Access TV, and then um, uh, uh, we did a deal with um, Promised Land, uh, who's, who's on who's coming out on Cult Records now. Um, and Donald Cummings from the Virgins, we did we did a pub deal with with him, um, which I think he's released. I don't even know; it's been so long, but I think he's doing it. He's releasing it as a Virgins record. So, yeah, I got involved into it heavily, um, and we still do it. You know, we still we still you know provide a lot of music for. Uh, for movies and stuff and that's sort of it was a kind of easier transition because a lot, a lot of friends of mine were editors you know a lot of friends of mine were producers and editors so it was easy to sort of say okay well we've got all these tracks and i want to get this artist to do this track for this this movie and stuff like that and uh, and it was an easier trend it was easy to transition to that right so just for like in layman's terms you're buying the rights to someone like promised lands music and then you can kind of sell that on. Is that kind of the idea? Well, you're buying the rights to the artist for a, pe for a period of time. You, you're right. not, not forever. Um, you'd buy it for like five years, 10 years, sometimes 15 years. And, and you'll, depending on how much money you pay them, effectively, um, once you recoup that advance you've given them, that money you've given them, um, 
then you 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 then effectively split. You you agree on a split for whatever the song is used for. So if it gets used in a movie and they pay you five grand, you know it's you know they pay you twenty five hundred each, and and that carries on and, and until the end of the contract that you have with them. Um, I can't remember the deal with Promised Land to be honest. But I think he's recouped. I think he's he's you know we've, we've he's he's had a few so his one of his one of his tracks has been used a few times already because um, he has a collaboration with Julian Casablancas, one of the songs Julian sings with him on it, and uh, you know it's a it's a it's a it's a good song. I mean he's a great he's a great artist. He's very crazy. You know he's I don't know if you've ever seen his shows. My God, they're insane. Yeah, he like climbs the ceilings and all sorts. Yeah. Yeah. He's definitely like you know, proper full on nut job, you know. <laughs> was that a Grand Theft Auto thing? Yeah, it's like yeah. a Grand Theft Auto thing. It was like um, he he got a few songs in there, and I think Julian has like his own built in radio station in Grand Theft Auto. And uh, really, <laughs> yeah, he kind of his manager, his manager Ben Goldstein was like a huge fan of the Five Clock Heroes, and is like one of my closest friends, you know. He's um, a great guy, great kid. When we met him in St. Louis, you know, he was like a 15-year-old kid and he liked it on merch. Wait, what, what does he do now? He manages Julian. <laughs> that's, that's, a, that's funny. I remember him. Yeah. And he was like a little kid. Him. Yeah, I know. And he, and he worked with me for a long time and then, you know, on, on the publishing side. And actually, to be honest, he managed a lot of the bands that we've done publishing deals with. Um, we, should, we should have gotten that 15-year-old to manage us. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That's exactly what we should have done. He would actually got us a deal. So, yeah, how about you, Elliot? Like, um, briefly mentioned at the beginning about your TV work and you are involved in Wild Wild Country, which I'm sure a lot of people listening to the podcast of watch, like just gives an idea of what you've been up to. Yeah. Um, well, it took a, there's a few years, uh, have to post post band stuff where I'm like, what am I going to do? Am I going to do music? Like what's going on? Um, and then I just, I somehow, I knew I wanted to work in film. I've always kind of I've been interested in that. And then, um, <clears throat> I just sort of fell into sound post-production sound for film. So, you know, like it's it's kind of boring to talk about, but it's a fun job, you know, making movies sound like movies, making TV shows sound like TV shows. A lot of it's like cleaning up bad audio, but some of it's like adding in fun stuff. Um, so I, I ended up moving to Los Angeles, um, you know, working on different movies and stuff. And yeah, I did, I did. So I mixed, I did the, a lot of the sound editing and, and I mixed, Wild Wild Country. So, you know, when you picture those people behind a mixing board, that's that's what I was doing for that. Um, that was a fun one because it was, uh, I knew it was good, but it was just another one of those small projects. Just like me and the director in a room for like a month, um, you know, doing all that stuff. There's a lot of weird sound design in that, that, you know, it was fun to do. And then it just sort of blew up. And I was like, oh, everyone likes this? <laughs> but you never know. You never know what people are going to like. Um, and so that was, I don't know. I heard a lot of, there's a lot of fun, weird stories I heard about that time period. And do you, what do you want to know about it? Do you want to know? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, if you've if all seen it, then you know. Uh, but it was fun to work on. Oh, I have a story from that. So that premiered at, at Sundance, um, which is a film festival in utah here it's kind of like a big you know indie film festival well it's pretty mainstream at this point but uh so it premiered there and and the one of the guys from the series showed up uninvited the lawyer guy i forget like narem i think was his his like weird cult name um he just showed up like not happy not happy about it not happy to, that it was a series um and we were afraid that he was gonna like i don't know, like they had to get added security to the because wow. i guess he had he, he was like he, i think he's like super into guns and stuff we're like well this guy showed wow. up uninvited 
and he's just glaring at us. We're like, we should probably tell Netflix so that they get some security on here so this guy doesn't come. Is that, I don't know, I thought they did a pretty good job of, you know, fair representation of both sides of that in that, that documentary. But I guess, you know, because it wasn't all one-sided, just talking about how um, Osho was, you know, the second coming, then he wasn't happy about it. So that was fun. That was a fun little scary moment. And yet that wasn't like nearly as exciting as like one, any show, any random show I played in England. But um, <laughs> you know, it is, it's a fun, you know, it's a fun, fun gig and you can still be creative. Uh, you can, people actually have jobs and families, raise families and stuff, you know, doing this. <laughs> it's like, oh, it's a real job. I can, I'm not going to get like 40 quid after a show and then like hope I'll make it last. Yeah, I don't know. It was also one of those things where I thought maybe I wanted to do like compose for film. And then I realized I would just something about music. I would love to do music in a way where it's just like I got rich off of it. But <laughs> it's it's for it's me, impressive. it's like I'm I'm super emotionally invested in anything that I do musically. Um so that it's just strain. Just writing is like emotionally strain. And and then to have, when you're composing for film, because I've done it a few times, have, you'll write something and you can't help but like kind of emotionally invest in it. And then the director's like, no, nah, I don't like it. <laughs> you know, and you're, you're not used to that in a band. You're like, what? It's like, fuck, <laughs> fuck you, fuck you don't like it. This is what it is, but you can't do that. And, you know, so I started, you know, working in sound for film where it's like, you know, if they say like, oh, I want, you know, I want to hear this line of dialogue louder or, you know, or let's take out the music here. I don't, I have no, I have no attachment to it. You know, it's still like fun, but I'm not going to get emotionally invested. Mm. But yeah, that's what I'm doing now. So. Yeah. And does that kind of build from, I don't know, do you get some experience from somewhere or you getting in somewhere and then it kind of snowballs from there kind of thing? Yeah. I mean, I was lucky enough to, one of our good friends is, um, who actually directed all of our music videos, this guy, Adam Neustadter. He, like I knew people that were already making films, you know, who could sort of, oh, I'm doing this short or whatever. You can, you can do the sound. And I ended up going back to school for a year to just like, all right, I'm really going to learn it. Once I decided I wanted to do it. So that's a whole nother thing. We talk about humbling, you know, you're 30 and you're going back to school and you're like, surrounded by 23 year olds. Like, oh my God, what am I doing? <laughs> um, but it paid off. So yeah, but I so I knew people in the film industry already. This was like a, a bonus about using that leverage from being in a in a scene already. You know, music scene. You kind of get to know people in that the film industry as well. So I knew I could kind of like use that as a kind of stepping stone in, into into it. But you know, it's still you still have to kind of like work a ton of shitty jobs until you you get the good ones, and then hopefully keep it rolling. I've seen you've been to a few award shows. What's the biggest one you've been to? What was that like? Oh, you mean the film stuff? Yeah, like is it the Emmys you've been to? I mean, yeah, yeah. I got the Wild Wild Country. I got nominated for the best best sound for that. Uh, me and and the other guys I worked with on that. Um, that, that was also was totally unexpected, you know, because it was it was such a low budget thing that I was like, oh, okay, fine, <laughs> all right, let's go. And yeah, it was just like celebrities everywhere. We got invited to some netflix party and it's just like michael douglas and you know diane Keaton, like people walking around you're like i don't belong here this is fun um very hollywood i mean it's fun you know it's not again you know you don't it's you don't feel like a rock star i'll tell you that much but <laughs> you, it's it's cool a little bit of you know a little bit of that fun kind of like fake glamour but um, yeah, I think we, we ended up losing to Anthony Bourdain's show, which is all right, fine. You know, I was happy to, that we got nominated. I tr I'm trying to, there's nothing super crazy happening. I was hoping, oh, well, I guess I did go to some Emmy, Emmy's parties after, oh, my phone just fell over. Some Emmy's parties, we went and it was right when like Game of Thrones, right? Like had the, all their awards. And I was at one point I was at this party and I was just like standing there with uh, my friend and we we looked around us and we're like, wait a minute. We're so, we realized we were in this circle of people and everyone around us was in Game of Thrones. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, well, holy shit. Like, that's like Jon Snow. He's just, he's, he's talking to, um, I forget her name now. It's been too long. It was weird. That was surreal. 
especially on a show like that. I remember a lot of like weird stuff happening at those enemy parties and the after parties. Um, and you know, when I, so, but now I find that like, I'm watching, I'll watch like the great British baking show, like, right. This is how I get my Anglophile uh, kicks now. And like no fieldings on there. And I'm like, I'm pretty sure I remember that guy being fucking shit faced <laughs> at the enemy awards. <laughs> and like, and now, now here we are. Now he's like, Oh, Oh, that's a lovely cupcake. And I'm like, Noel's right. That's, an, that's a pretty good cupcake. You know, like this is what we're doing now. I, 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 get, a, I get a kick out of that. It always makes me laugh. Yeah, he was so fucking everywhere. Fucking people are so fucked up all the time. It's just it's so funny. Yeah, we were queuing up to watch The Strokes last year and this guy in a massive fair cut turned up and it's Noel Fielding. So it's quite funny. <laughs> yeah, he still, yeah, walked, of course. he still walked around in winkle pickles and skinny jeans. Yeah, yeah it looks yeah. exactly the same. Yeah, I, I, it's, I didn't think we were part of like an era then, you know. But then now you see, like, yeah. my girlfriend. My girlfriend's now is like, I still have some of the same clothes. Like at some point, you just you're like, I'm, I'm this is what I wear, whatever. And she's <laughs> yeah. she's like, what? She's like, why are you still wearing this? Not this isn't 2003. Like, <laughs> <laughs> this is what I wear. <laughs> Oh my god! I guess I, I guess it's not. I was like, but this was. You don't understand though. Like, I was doing this. I was doing this before it was cool, and then it got popular, and now it's not cool. I'm like, well, I'm not going to change. I don't know. <laughs> Whatever. What was the high point of the whole experience of being in the band? Do you think playing Japan was always like when, even when I was like 12, you know, just. <laughs> The idea of playing in a rock band was so far fetched, and I thought, oh, if we ever, if I was ever in a band, if we ever played Japan, like that would be, that's so surreal that I can't even imagine it. And then when we got to do it, honestly, like the best, the most fun mm. week I think that we did, just in, and not, you know, not because we like made a ton of friends in Japan or anything, just because it was so weird. It was, and we all got along really well that trip because we're all just in this new like in england i felt like anthony was like oh you don't understand english well, you know when we were in america we were like you don't get it but in <laughs> japan japan we had no idea what what was up and what was down and um we did this re- pretty big tour with um oh, the ordinary no. boys oh. and the um, view in the view and it was just it was just a super we didn't talk to the ordinary boys more than six words but the the um well everything was so efficient we were taking like bullet trains everywhere um people were set mm. i remember we when we first set up our gear and we're so not used to this but there's like 20 interns watching us set up our gear i remember this kid was standing this japanese kid and he's like sitting next to me writing down like where like the levels on my pedals were i was like that's a weird thing and then like we played the show, we left, and I remember talking to our manager, Pat, and being like, where's our, what's happened to our gear? They're like, oh, they already moved it to the next city. I'm like, what? All right. And we got to the next city. We got there because we were the first band. All our stuff was already set up, and all my pedals were already fine-tuned to the exact levels that I want them. <laughs> yeah, yeah, And I'm like, oh, man, I could get used to this. <laughs> um, yeah. The respect but, so, that they have over there is mental. Yeah, it was just... Yeah, there, there was one point I've never felt like more of a rock, rock, rock star, Undes- even undeservedly or whatever. But we played this. What was the big venue in Tokyo? There was some. I don't know. It was like five thousand people. Okay. Or there was always so big. And we was so we played the show and like oh like what I've done ever since I've been playing shows since I was like fifteen is I go watch the other bands play like from the crowd. But I couldn't do that there. I walked out and like two hundred. Japanese kids came up to me like asking for autographs. I was like, this is the weirdest thing. Uh, this is like, you guys don't understand. Like I'm nobody, but whatever. Um, and so that kind of stuff, I was like, well, no matter what happens, you know, that, that those memories are fun. Mm. Uh, what was my high point? Um, we, we weren't getting along very well. I know that's that. a good start. But uh, 
Well, it was always a different. <laughs> there was always a different stress level for me. I don't know what you know. I mean, I was financially fucked anyway at that point. But, um, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I you know, and um, this was pre two thousand eight, and um, we played the Hurricane Festival, and uh, we played it. I remember we played in the tent, uh, in the big the big tent there, and I just well. The, the, maybe I'm mixing it up actually with we played the Bataclan do you remember that show Elliot yeah we played we were that so was a great show we were we were late for the gig we were like super fucking late like, like, everyone was screaming at us what the fuck you're fucking late you know you're just driven from England you fucking eat arseholes you've got no time for sound no time for sound Jake no and we were like just fuck you man we've just been on the show for like you know we've been touring for like fucking two years <laughs> you think we need a fucking sound Jake just fucking no, we'll play the show right now and um and we were supporting Jet, and the, it was great. Um, and we just went on, and we just it was just like I think we did a very very quick sound check. I think just before I don't even know if we did a sound check there. And we played. I just yeah. remember it was like chaos. People went bonkers, and we were honestly. I just felt like we were on fire. It was just a very very. We just completely rocked it. And yeah. I know. After that show, I know that even, and it's always good to talk to the band who's going to come on after you um, at the end of the show. And they were like, well, we did not expect that. And it was great because you know, the crowd were just fucking crazy. The headline band realized that. Jet realized, they were like, holy shit, this, this band actually you know, can really deliver. Yeah. I remember that. That was probably one of our best shows ever. I, it was one of those things where it's like we're playing and then people are crowd surfing. People are just going nuts and you're like what is this a joke <laughs> what <laughs> what do we do to deserve this and uh so i always have but i was wondering tom if you ever had this have you ever played have you ever played with a band you're like all right you're opening for these guys and then you think i hate those guys and all you do <laughs> all you do but like they're bigger than you all you do is talk shit about them yeah, the whole time Be like, uh... can you put and so we're like can we put playing with jet I hate jet and then we play and then they're so nice to us. They're like, yeah. he's like, wow, you guys, you guys fucking rock. That was awesome. Like you, they really they loved you out there. I'm like, thanks, man. And then I'm like, fuck, god damn it. I was like, Jet is really nice. And all I did was talk shit about them for like three days leading up to this. I feel like such an asshole. Um, so yeah, that. But I, yeah. So I, I now, now it's like, and I'm, I felt like very attached to that venue too. So like. Everybody talks shit about Jet. Everybody yeah, talks shit about this guy. You, you I mean, like they, they're now, millionaires. <laughs> yeah. No, no. I mean, I, I'll take it. I'll take it so far. I'm not gonna just start liking the music. I can't. <laughs> but <laughs> I'm not a saint. Um, but I, yeah. I don't know. Whatever. They're rich and famous. Like I don't feel too bad. But I, 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 I can't. I couldn't help it. I was like, oh man, they're super nice to us. That did not. That did, I thought they were gonna be jerks. That was a good show. That was a good yeah. show. And there was another one at the Hurricane Festival. I, I do remember that was a great show. But we weren't, we were coming to the sort of end of the period, but it was, we were just, you know, by that point, we were really just quite, a, 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 we were a very good live band at that point. We just, we really were. Yeah. I feel like people who are, were very into this scene in the mid 2000s are going to be like, oh, yeah. Five o'clock heroes. I completely <laughs> forgot about that band. They were just in my life for three years. And I would like they'd be randomly playing all the time. And then poof, they disappeared. And I like moved on with my life. And so I've, hopefully maybe this will be like a, a little flashback for them. I saw that they, there was that ha hashtag a few years ago, Indie Amnesty. Do you remember that? There's some on Twitter. Ooh, yeah, I remember that. We we made it into a few of those. A few to be like, be like <laughs> I, I, I did as well. Yeah, because like I sold merch. It's like the lead singer of the Five O'Clock Heroes convinced me to sell merch for them, and I did it. I don't know, like, you know. <laughs> That's. The... <laughs> I was having a beer, like outside. You know, this was uh, before this first, this previous, this lock lockdown in the UK, and uh, what was it, November or something? And I was standing outside with a friend of mine, Chris, and 
you know, he 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 sort of had a different, entirely different London scene. Same with the same age, but he had an entirely different London scene. It was sort of more like a dance scene or whatever he was doing. So he doesn't know anything about his bands. And we've been friends a long time. We're just standing there having a beer, and this guy just walks past with his girlfriend, and he's like, "Anthony Alex from Five O'clock Heroes." <laughs> <laughs> This is like, you guys, you guys should have been huge. You should have been fucking huge. <laughs> and I was like, calm down. What the fuck are you doing, bro? Uh, and he was lovely. He's like, you should have been huge, right? You should have been huge. Chris was like, really? You know this fucking guy? <laughs> yeah, I you know who he was. Um, he was a lovely guy. He, was a, he, was, he worked for this thing called the Stylist or Stylist Online and something. And he was a really lovely guy, and he just obviously it was a period of time where he was obviously he was obviously into his bands, like a lot of people at that period. And um, <laughs> we obviously were one of them, you know. Just had a good time. Is there anything you do differently? No, I don't think so. I don't think I don't think there's anything. I think we could have stayed together longer, but you know, I'm sure fucking you know, you know. John, Paul, John, and Ringo fucking thing. That I have no idea. You know, I don't think I don't think you can. I regret that we didn't do a second album together. Yes, for sure. Because, but I, I was a different person then, and I think, you know, Elliot's absolutely right about what he said. But there was just too much. There was too. There was too much weight on me. Uh, not from a creative perspective. From from because I, I was doing a lot of the. Um, I was taking a lot of financial wait we weren't we weren't the labels weren't helping uh, us at the time and things were changing so i was taking some a lot of financial hits and i was just feeling the heat you know and um it just changes the dynamic when it's about money so yeah, that's the one maybe i'd have a regret that we didn't do a second record in a, in a more creative way in a more relaxed fashion as the original guys that's that's probably my only regret, but I don't have any real regrets. I mean, I look at I list, I think of those times. Sometimes I sort of laugh about things I remember um, from from nights out. <laughs> just thinking about times, you know, and it's and it just there's nothing you can't ever take it away. It's just amazing, you know. And I hope that a lot of bands go through that. Going to have those good moments. We had a lot of good moments. We really did. I do think it was kind of a, I mean, there's not really anything here. I, I agree with Anthony. Where it's like, yeah, sure, I wouldn't go back and be like, I'll change a million things. But then then I'd have to accept that like nothing, nothing about me now would exist, you know? Not all people I've met since then, like I probably would have met them and all this stuff. So it's kind of an impossible, ta- uh, you know, if you were actually hung up on that it's not going to serve you well but i i think i was going to piggyback on what he said about the just that time period i think it was a very specific time period that we were very lucky to be a part of because i mean i don't really follow much trouble even following music these days i can't yeah. tell what's popular and what's what um i know what i like but um then it was very like we happened to live in a time period where we got to play dirty pop rock and roll and you know uh people liked it and there was there were venues to play and you could play it on the radio and it was like there was an actual there was a lot of good music happening and it felt like in that time period you were existing then you know you were like in the now as they say you weren't like thinking about oh man maybe one day i can do this or thinking back you know i used to when i was growing up like in college i would say like reminisce about being in a band in the 70s or 60s or something like that i just thought it was impossible i thought like the last good band that got popular was nirvana you know i'm like this is not it's 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 uh it's all just shit bands now and then suddenly this scene cropped up and you know a lot of it was like the strokes and the white stripes kind of started it and we were lucky enough to be of the age where that was, I guess we're all had that in common that we all like this music that didn't exist really anymore. And so we got to do it. And I don't feel like, I don't know how much rock bands are touring around now doing that kind of thing, but it doesn't seem as much. It doesn't seem like it's the same at all. There was enough where you could get sort of popular on the internet, but it wasn't like people were still buying records. There was still, Enemy was still a magazine, you know, it was still enough of the old time period and the new, like it was a nice 
merging of the two. Now it's all new. Now it's like everything's over the internet. I'm sure it's fine for some bands, but it's not how I would have wanted it. Yeah, the, I don't think it exists anymore. Mm. I don't think it feel it. I don't think it exists in that that way anymore. I mean, if I have one regret, it's probably that I I didn't play enough shows with Dustin's Bar Mitzvah. <laughs> <laughs> I remember because my our neighbour here, she was she's an artist and she she was she she remembers the going all those frog nights, and I and I never forget like I never forget so many cans and bottles being thrown at bands um, during those during those nights at like that, that frog night was like under the Astoria venue mm. on um, Charing Cross Road, uh, which is not there anymore. And I remember, I remember just, a, I remember Tom Frog throwing a can of beer from the side of the stage and it hitting uh, the lead singer of Dustin's Permits for like right on the head. And he just, he, he thought it was someone in front of him in the crowd. He just jumped into the crowd. <laughs> you remember that? <laughs> Not well, thinking that it would come from the side of the stage. I mean, why would a can come from the side of the stage? It's impossible. One last one. Like we usually ask people for a story about the Gallagher brothers, but I guess if you've got a good one about yeah, playing cards with the strokes or something like that, would be great. Elliot, do you have a good story? <laughs> I have a good I have a good story about I do have a good poker story. I don't remember his name actually, but he um he was a lovely guy and uh, he was very quiet, didn't really know how to play poker very well. He came to one of Ryan's poker games and you know, Ryan's games were the they're still great. And anyway, so it's a pretty, 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 it's not a cheap game to play, but it's, yeah. And so it's early on in the, in the evening and guy goes all in. Uh, okay. I, I got to see that, see what he's got, you know? So I go all in. <laughs> he's got like a, he's got like a pair of twos or something. <laughs> something like ter- something terrible, you know? And I was like, shit, why'd you go all in on that? You know? And uh, next hand, he does exactly the same thing. And it just so happens that I've got to see that hand because I've got a great hand. And I turn it over and, all right, and he's got like a pair of fucking fours or something. It was like, they're not nothing. And, uh, and he's like, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm out of cash. I, I got to go to the, I got to go to the bank ATM down the street and get more cash. And I felt so bad because I just like, you know, I felt like this guy didn't know how to play the game and uh, he just gone all in and taken like a bunch of money from him. And he, and he leaves to go to the ATM. And I was like, man, I said to the table, I was like, oh, I feel pretty bad now. You know, who is this guy? And, uh, and Ryan's goes, you feel bad for that guy, right? Uh-huh, uh-huh. Well, that's Paul Simon's son. Uh, you ever heard of an album called Graceland? I think he can go out and get the fucking ATM and get some more cash. How do you think? I was like, <laughs> get that motherfucker back in here. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, that's good. I, that reminds me, I've, I think I've, I don't really have any... Great stroke story. I could tell you a couple, but I have a good Anthony poker story that I'm also going to tell you. Um, I think one one sort of random moment was so it was in London. I think Strokes had just played Shepherd Shepherd's Bush Empire or somewhere like that. I don't know. I get a, a it was one of those big venues like yeah towards the south like southwest or I don't know. Mm. <clears throat> um, and we're hanging out backstage with them, and then at some point I was just like it was just me and Julian out on the stage after they played, but empty. And we started just talking about how, how much do we like George Michael's first album? It was like the most <laughs> random. And he's like, yeah, man, that was my first album. I really got into it. I'm like, oh man, yeah, I love George Michael's first album. And <laughs> we're just reminiscing for like 10 minutes about George Michael, how much we like George Michael's first album. I'm like, this is not what I, the conversation I would expect to have. Right now, but um, the I remember that so well. For Anthony, we were in Germany. We're at. uh, She probably knows what I'm talking about. Who's the guy that? Don't don't say anything crazy, man. My wife's gonna hear the shit. No, no, no. It was the German. (laughs) Who's the German guy that will kind of we? Who's like our? A record label kind of guy in Germany. Oh yeah, the the the, the old guy. I can't remember his fucking name. Yeah, Jesus. We were at his house. Okay. This German guy, and he's like, <laughs> "Oh, you guys want to play poker? Come on, yeah." And of course, Andy's like, "Let's do it." And I'm like, "I don't know how to play cards. I'm fine. I don't want to play." And so they're over there playing cards forever, and we're 
I guess he had been making the guy who was hosting us was like, oh, I made some chili, go get some chili. Um, and I'm with Simon, who, you know, the, the uh, Paddington's sound guy. Um, he was yeah, our sound yeah. guy at the time. And he's like, fetch us a bowl, you know, fetch us a bowl, boy. Like, we have to bring him chili because he's too busy playing poker. And so Simon's <laughs> like, fine. And Simon's like, hey, hey, check it out. And he pulls out this bottle of hot sauce that has like, skulls all over it <laughs> you know and we're like and we just fucking dump half the bottle in anthony's <laughs> chili stir it around <laughs> we bring back chili for everyone we hand the bowl to anthony and we know because we've tasted that hot sauce that hot sauce is like blazing hot <laughs> and we watch him eat and he's not flinching he's not eating it and we're like what did you give him the right bowl like he's not even reacting I'm like how's this bo-? like yeah no that's the yellow one we gave that's his and he's like how is he not feeling that? And he's sitting there and he's trying to have a poker face so hard that he doesn't want to show that he thinks that chili, chili is too spicy. And so we start to notice he's beads of sweat pouring and he's just like, <laughs> sweat is just rolling down his face. He looks insane. And we're like, oh no, that's hot. He's just pretending it's not. And I think, and was it was a Jurgen, was that his name? He's just like, He's looking over at Anthony and be like, what is wrong with this guy? He's trying to keep his poker face, but sweating profusely. And then eventually Anthony's like, well, that's, that's kind of hot chili, isn't it? And he's, and he's eating his. And he's like, no, it's not hot at all. That's, this guy can't handle his chili. And meanwhile, Simon and I are like dying laughing. Just, it was the, if you could just watch someone eating chili, pretending like it's not hot. You can imagine how funny that is. <laughs> Time that times that by a hundred with Anthony. Uh, uh, and eventually, yeah, eventually he found out and he had to like, I don't know, go throw up or something. But it was <laughs> that was that was a highlight. I should have said that was a highlight of the band. But they bullied me, man. <laughs> they bullied me. What are you gonna do? Get your own chili next time.